In large-scale studies of deformation associated with crustal shortening in mountain belts and with stretching of the upper crust during rifting, it is common to estimate strain using cross-sections. We'll look at how strain can be measured on cross-section and some of the assumptions that might underlie these measurements. We'll examine a crustal scale strain history and then draw a note of caution as to how larger scale heterogeneous strains should be reported so that comparisons can be made appropriately from place to place. So when looking at cross sections we're going to compare the length of the cross section we see today and the strata it contains with the inferred original length of those strata. So we're going to be looking at the strain parameter longitudinal strain. So longitudinal strain is the change in length of lines. It's represented by the parameter E for elongation, which is simply the length of the cross section we see today, L1. Take away the inferred original length, L0, divided by that original length of section. So the first thing we must do is to specify the beginning and the end of the measurements. So how much bed length we're going to worry about. And obviously it's critical that the measurements we make are between these two points, both for the L1 and the L0 measurement. We're interested in the change in length, so the difference between L1 and L0. But by dividing by the original length, we create a parameter elongation that has no dimensions. That means it's scale invariant. We can compare estimates that we get on a small scale with those on a large scale. For example, if we wanted to see whether the strain was homogeneous through different scales of observation. Well, we'll introduce these concepts using this cross-section here by Sabina Biji and her co-workers through part of the Zagros fold belt in Iran. So the first thing we're going to do is set up reference points. The reference point on the left there is called the pin line. It's termed that because we're assuming there's no interbed slip out beyond it, but actually that assumption is not relevant to what we're doing here but the frontal point is the pin. The back end is called the loose or trail line and we're going to worry about that orange horizon which is a unit within the Mesozoic strata and we're going to measure between two points one on the pin line and one on the loose line. It has a present day length which is simply the straight line distance measured between pin and loose line of 70 kilometers. The sinuous length of that bed measured along the length of the white line is 77 kilometers. So we're going to assume that all we have to do is to pull that white line out to be flat to have a length of 77 kilometers and that is the original length of section. So L0 77 kilometers, L1 the length today 70 kilometers. So we'll apply the equation for elongation and the number is minus 0 0.09. In this there's an assumption that we have conserved bed length or bed thickness. There's no distortional strain along the bed. So a simple line length measurement along the length of that sinuous white line that we've made of 77 kilometers is representative of the length L0. It needn't be like that. Let's consider a fold like this, which has got heterogeneous strain represented by different bed thicknesses and the distortions experienced by the strain ellipse embedded in that green bed. That's the deformed state. Dealing with a situation like this requires a multi-stage of process. So we'll start off by putting the bed flat and then simply rehanging the thickness of that unit, honouring its values that we see in the final deformed state into a part unraveled condition. This therefore shows what the bed looks like but still retains the strain in bed thickness. Then using our estimate of the original bed thickness we can unravel the whole thing while retaining the cross-sectional area of the bed. In other words we unpack the distortion. It's quite an elaborate process because it requires a lot of information about how different parts of that unit have become distorted. 
So it looks like our assumptions are okay for this Sagros example because the layer thickness is retained around the fold structures. So our estimates of elongation would presumably be reasonably reliable. Let's move away from the Zagros and consider the strain on a cross section in the Alps. Here's the cross section, it's crustal scale, so all that pink material on the section is crystalline basement down to the Moho. Notice the scale, it's 25 kilometers, and vertical and horizontal scales are equal. So this is the cross section we want to analyze. We can unravel the cross section based on geological understanding of the region to reveal this. And it shows a series of original basins that have been stacked up to make the final state section we see today. The details of this are not important for now. We're just going to use this restoration to do some analysis. So the change in length of section is what we're trying to analyze here. The present day cross section length L1 is simply a distance between a pin that we set up on the western end and Y, the eastern end of the cross section. And we can identify both places on our restored section and make a measurement L0. These are the values. So L1 has a distance of 126 kilometers, L0 has a length of 183. We now just plug those values into our expression for elongation, which comes out like this. So the elongation here is minus 0.31. And that's for the whole cross section. As we saw in the Zagros, it's negative here because this structure is contractional. The deformation to move from the lower state to the top state involves shortening and thickening the crust. Right, let's come back and look at the lower section now. Because the lower section involves a series of normal faults. These are rift basins. So let's do a little analysis on this. We can put the top section away. So the strain associated with rifting. We can make a measurement between a pin and the eastern end of the section at point Y. It's a value we've already used. But we can also estimate the top of the crust that has been faulted. The purple line that's just appeared there represents the top of the basement that existed before faulting. So the lower diagram here now is taking all the top of the basement there that represents the unconformity at the top of the basement and packing those pieces back together again to determine the original length of section. So we can see that those segments restored to a full length of 166 kilometers and the difference between that and the colored version on top is 17 kilometers which represents the amount of stretch that the crust has experienced during the rift phase. Now the length of the rift basins is our L1 because this is the deformation we're interested in. L0 is that restored length for the top of the crust. So those are the values. L1 is 183 kilometers. L0 is 166 kilometers. The difference, 17 kilometers, is the amount of kilometer stretch that the crust has seen. The elongation that represents is 0.1. It's a positive value because the crust has been extended as it went from L0 to L1. So we have a history here that we can chart using elongation. The crust started off with the top of the basement all joined up. It then rifted, creating normal faults, and the crust extended, and then it thickened again during the Alpine deformation to create the structure we see today. Those are the various values we've used to calculate elongation. The initial stage, the elongation is positive. It actually represents a stretching of the crustal length and a value of 0.1. To go from the rift basins to the thickened crust, we have contracted the crust. It's shortened, so it's a negative elongation. And the value of that is minus 0.31.
So it's a nice illustration of charting how string has evolved through the history of crustal evolution. Notice that we have to redefine what is L1 and L0 between each step. Those terms L1 and L0 refer to a single step in our geological history. We can also apply this to look at strain in, in specific parts of the section so we can see whether some parts of our cross section are more strained than others. And we can do this between marker Y and a place about halfway along our cross section, this length here. So we must be careful to define our marker points and make sure we can chart them on the restored section. So therefore we can make a measurement on the restoration that is directly comparable with that on the deformed state. So we can make our measurements again, there they are. L0 is the restored length of 110 kilometers. That equipment geology has been contracted to a length of L1, which is 74 kilometers. We can plug those numbers into the expression for elongation, and we come out with a strain of minus 0.33. It's a contractual strain, therefore it's a negative E for this eastern part of our cross-section. And of course we can then compare this with the value we obtained for the whole cross-section, which was minus 0.13. So that bit of cross-section that we were looking at in the east, that bit of deformed crust, has recorded a higher distortional strain than the cross-section as a whole. So this is a useful approach for quantifying variations in strain as you go into a mountain belt like the Alps. But when comparing different areas, is E the correct measurement to report? It's very common in regional analyses for structural geologists to report variations in strain from one place to another in a mountain belt simply using elongation. We have to be really careful about that. The reason is because the place we set up as our reference points, the pin and the Y point on here, are arbitrary. With that in mind, let's imagine reciting our pin 25 kilometers further out to the west ahead of the Alps. So we're adding another 25 kilometers of crust length to both the final state section at the top and the restored section below. What's the effect of this on our numbers? So L1 now becomes 151 kilometers from a previous value of 126. L0 is also gone up 25 kilometers from 183 to 208 kilometers. Plug those values into the expression below. The difference between the L1 and L0 is 57 kilometers. It's a negative value because that's a contractual structure. L0 is 208 kilometers. So the elongation is minus 0.27. The value we first calculated was minus 0.31. The structures are the same structures. The strain is the same strain. But the way we've set the problem up has been different. And perhaps you can see why. If we go to that expression for E, the difference between L1 and L0 is still 57 kilometers because we've added 25 kilometers to both the L1 and L0 value. But the term by which we've divided our expression, L0, has changed by 25 kilometers. Consequently, the value of E has changed. So it might be that actually what we should do is simply report the crustal shortening in kilometers. It remains 57 kilometers regardless of where we put the pin. It could be another 100 kilometers out to the left and the difference in the section length would still be 57 kilometers. So for comparing cross sections from place to place, it may be better to keep dimensions, not to use the dimensions parameter E. When comparing within cross sections and to look at distortion within a place, we can keep tabs on where our pins are. So it's maybe appropriate then to think about the elongation, the dimensionless parameter. So we can use cross sections to quantify deformation history, but take care 
where you position your pins and loose lines and especially we need to think rather carefully about whether we use the dimensions parameter E or kilometers. Nevertheless cross sections represent the best source of information on the amount of deformation on a large scale and therefore are essential for linking outcrop to tectonics.